Good evening, listeners. You're listening to the Lament of Hope blog and podcast. I'm really excited today to kind of dive into the topic of fertility and the birthing process as well as motherhood. I think it's a it's a very complex, but I also think misunderstood topic. And I think it's a very daunting one for ladies, especially young women who are thinking about this or pondering that step of life or who are in it. Um, and I'm talking today with Jess Snyder. She's the founder of Intimate Mama. Um, and she is a wellness and birth coach, as well as having experienced as a birthing nurse and a birthing center. Um, and she's had two boys of her own. And um, she actually coaches in birthing and wellness and has her very own philosophy about a holistic approach to the pregnancy journey as well as afterwards, which is just really refreshing and encouraging to see. Um, so just kind of just to start out, I wanted to ask you, what gave you a heart for this topic, specifically a more holistic approach? I think that's a, um, a long-winded answer, but from the almost decade that I've been working as a labor and delivery nurse, in a hospital setting, I think I've seen all the medicine and I've seen such incredible miracles happen because of the Western medicine that we have to offer. Hmm. And I have also recognized um, all the things that aren't offered with medicine and all of the tools that we have within our bodies and um, with natural means that can help in all of the steps um, from fertility to and through motherhood. Um, and I find that our Western society has really just almost relied on medicine in mm. this world instead mm. of our own innate knowing. And I think through these many years and through motherhood and the birth journey myself, I've just, um, kind of come back to that just inner wealth of knowledge and um, that our bodies have and that our um, ancestors knew about that we are not taught. Did you always want to be a mom or did the like the idea of motherhood not become really exciting to you until later in life? I think I always knew that I wanted to be a mom. I think from a young age, I always felt that I like couldn't wait to be a mom and I was so excited to do that. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to find the right person to go through this journey with. And my husband yeah. actually didn't know that he wanted to have kids. And then when he met me, he was like, okay, but I think this would make sense because you seem to be like the right person to do this with. Um, because in previous generations, it was the moms who did most of the work and the dads, um, most of the work at home. And then the dads would go out into the working field. Um, and in this day and age, we have a lot of equality in the work field. Um, and we need equality at home too. Otherwise it puts that extra burden on the uh, mother to upkeep a household and work full time. Um, mm. so I, men are stepping into that role at home a lot in these, um, new families that I'm seeing and just in this generation and it's really beautiful. And so I think my husband knew that he really wanted to be a big part of it. Um, if he was going to become a father. How can there be that equality? Cause that's an interesting thing you're talking about because I do think the pregnancy journey is very woman focused, but it's interesting because obviously it took the man for the lady to have a woman, you know, to have a child in the first place. And I think for some men, like, you know, they feel kind of like outsiders that there's not really much they can do. You know, what are they supposed to do kind of being like a bystander? How did it for you and your husband, how did the pregnancy journey feel more equal, like being involved with each other as well as when they, your, your boys were born? That's a great question. I'd say probably the pregnancy part less so, um, but more in parenthood. But I will say that there are many ways that um, partners can be empowered um, in the pregnancy and that that can be any partner, uh, male or female. But if you're not the person carrying the baby, there's still ways to support, right? Um, when you know that the journey is going to be through birth and that is that kind of fear that you're describing that a lot of young women 
can experience when they're thinking about their transition to motherhood yeah. that in the birth space is both of your experience becoming a parent. Um, and it's not just the one, one is being initiated through the physical birthing process. And the other one is being initiated um, as that support person that you're soon both to be the parents. And so in pregnancy, we did a lot of um, like meditation or visualizations together or um, as a um, birth coach, my husband would ask me questions about birth and we would talk about it and I would describe how I imagined him supporting me in the labor room and he described his fears of you know, what you see in the movies with the woman like screaming at the partner and being like in hysterics and it being this like really dramatic um, space. And he was fearful that I was going to be mean to him during that time. And so we talked about both of our fears and how each of us wanted the other person to show up. Um, and so having those conversations, hmm. just having conversations about how you envision parenting going before becoming parents right? It's different when you talk about the um, theory of it versus, you know, how it happens in reality. But it's nice to have those conversations like this is how I view things. And this is how I view things. Because otherwise, if you don't have those conversations beforehand, it shows up in the moment, and that can bring on a lot of stress. And hmm. um, we did a lot of those kinds of things where he was able to be a part of it. Our journey was a little bit different, because um we got pregnant in 2020 and my husband wasn't able to come with us to, with me to um, our prenatal visits and he couldn't be a part of those ultrasounds. And he said that the FaceTime just didn't do it for him. And we were like over, I think halfway through the journey when he finally spoke up and was like, you know, I'm so grateful that you feel so um, attached and bonded with this baby. But he said, I have not built that bond yet. And um, if you could tell me when the baby is kicking more, or, um, if we could, you know, take some more pictures and this and that and find other ways for him to be able to be a part of something mm. and build the bond with the baby. And we would often turn on music and we would watch my belly as our son danced in my belly while um, listening to the music and then he could see and feel um, the parts of pregnancy that I can feel all the time. And um, so then there's those ways of bonding as well for the partner. And then when it comes to parenthood, I think that's something that's new in this generation where the dads can be really involved. Um, but even something like um, with our first, I would do the first feed of the night and then my husband would do the second feed and that can be whether you're breastfeeding or bottle feeding um and so I would breastfeed before bed and my husband would um give a bottle of my pumped milk for the next feed and allow me a couple of hours of sleep and then we would take turns of like changing diapers and this and that so it wasn't only mm, wow. up in the night to feed and change diapers and this and that or um, this, my mother-in-law would laugh because, um, she was like, why are you guys both getting up in the night all the time? But it worked for us where, um, the baby would cry at the bedside. I would take him. I would hand him over to my partner. He would change the diaper and, um, swaddle him back up. And then I would breastfeed and then I'd put him back down. And so it felt less isolating. I think that's one thing that many new mothers feel is that isolation, that loneliness, that I'm the only one going through this when there's so many yeah. other moms just down the street experiencing the same thing. And um, it's hard to not feel lonely in that space. I felt lonely twice through it when I have this beautiful um, community of mothers, but it's just something that feels like, oh, like I'm in it by myself. And we have a lot of um, postpartum anxiety and depression that we're seeing. And so having a partner that's supportive, that's up with you, doing it with you, it feels like, okay, like we're in it. We're a team. We've done this together. We've chosen to become parents together. So let's do this together. Mm -hmm. um, today we're both off. And so one of us is running a load of laundry. The other one is doing some gardening. Um, we take one of us puts one of them to bed. One of us puts the other one. They're both currently napping. And so it feels like we're doing this together. And so that creates a really beautiful space in the home environment. 
um, where it's truly a partnership. Um, and, and so that's for us. Yeah. And it also, it gives, it seems like it also gives you the opportunity. I mean, like just doing this interview, being able to pursue some of your own passions at the same time and foster that part of you while also being a mom. And so it's not feeling completely like, okay, because I know for some women, children can become the identity. As soon as they're a mother, everything else is forgotten or really um, just there just seems to be no time for there to be any element of being able to immerse even for an hour or so in something they enjoy. Um, but it seems like for you, and as you're talking about being able to work with your partner on this, you're able to even experience a little bit of rest in the sense of being able to rejuvenate maybe with something you enjoy. Yeah, that's something that I really stress for new mothers is to and new parents, um, both is to kind of identify in the morning, like, Hey, what are the top three things that I really would like to do today? So maybe for me, it's yoga, some grocery shopping, and I really love a bath. And my husband might want to go to the gym, um, mow the lawns and I don't know, something else. And so then if we have those top three things then we can give the other person the space to do those. And as a new mom that comes home with a newborn, finding five minutes of self-care in the morning and in the evening can make a huge difference um, to where you're feeling like your cup is also being filled and then you can give from that space. Um, and so, yeah, finding that reprieve to gather yourself and remember who you are. And it's okay for your identity to be filled with motherhood and things. And I totally get that um, because you physically um, and mentally and emotionally change through motherhood. And it sounds very gay, um, but there are studies that have been shown that your brain actually changes and the way that you feel and respond to things is different than the way that your brain was pre-pregnancy, pre-delivery. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. And so in a way, no, there's not equality because my husband is the same person he was three years ago before we had kids and, and I have changed, you know, um, twofold. And so um, I have to remind him of that sometimes. Um, but what, yeah. what is something that you, what's a change that you really love? And maybe what's a change that has been difficult for you to adjust to? Yeah, I think um one thing that I think is both is how soft-hearted I've become and I love that because I just feel everything so deeply like how a beautiful day looks extra beautiful and how a side moment feels um extra heartbreaking and I just feel so deeply and maybe that's the Scorpio in me but um I really love that softness and the way that like a simple moment, my um, two and a half year old yesterday gave me a big hug and he's not a very touchy feely kid. He came over, gave me a big hug and he said, I love you, mama. You're my best friend. And I just was like taken aback and my heart just melted. But it's like every hard moment just gets erased after like something, you know, a sweet, simple moment like that. Um, and I find the softness has been hard as well. Um, something that I have found truly challenging is kind of that isolation being someone who mm -hmm. is first of my, um, friend group to have kids. It feels like everyone else is still, you know, going out and doing the things that we used to do together. And, um, although the invitations still sometimes come in, I just have had to learn to say no, um, because I, I am not always able to go and I can't tag along to kids to go bar hopping or <laughs> celebrate a birthday. And we're yeah. tied to this, which happen two to three times a day. And so um, we stay in and around the house, neighborhood parks. And sometimes we'll go, you know, on a drive and go somewhere and do naps in the car, but it's something that's focused around toddler fun. And I could take them around to adult things, but I just, 
get more joy out of seeing things for him. And so that's a personal choice. And I think I have in this last year just moved past feeling guilty about not being able to make it to everything and just giving myself permission to be in this slow season of my life. How have you communicated that with your friends? Because I know that can be, um, there's that tension there, right? There's a different season of life, but you were really close. And then someone's in a different season and then things look different and they can feel different. Um, how do you, how did you communicate to those around you? Like, you know, I love you. I want to be invested, but this is the season of life I'm in. So it's going to look differently. That's a great question. I'll be honest. I don't know that I have physically communicated it. And I think a lot of my friends have been pretty understanding where if I said something, they'd be like, yeah, of course. Um, but it's more so that inner guilt that feels like I want to be there. I want like the FOMO kind of thing where like you mm -hmm. want to be and are not able to. And so it's kind of been an unspoken thing. And I've um, noticed a lot of women and myself included, where I apologize to the moms that came before me that I wasn't there for them the way that I wished I was. And the same way that the moms behind me will feel as well, because it's not until you become a mother and recognize the ways that you need people to show up for you that you recognize you weren't able to do for others. Even my sister, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I asked you to possibly, we didn't end up getting married abroad because it was 2020, but, um, I asked her originally to fly to the Bahamas with her two, gosh, they would have been, yeah, like under two or three, um, two kids to the Bahamas, find them some childcare. And like, she had to show up for me. And I, that to me was an expectation. And she, I was like, oh, that's going to be really hard for me. Um, mm. and I didn't understand that. I was like, why? <laughs> and now I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I ever even asked you that. Um, and we had a Nikki's day this last time around um, with our second son. And now I recognize how to show up for Nikki moms because I thought I understood that in my line of work, but I didn't. And so mm -hmm. all of these things are coming through learned experience versus um, what you think people need. Mm -hmm. And so um, yeah, I think that, that I didn't need to say anything and I don't feel that there's any large tension. It just feels like, I know you'll get it when you're there. And that's such like a parent mm. day. Like, I feel like I could hear my mom and dad saying like, Oh, well, you'll get it when you have kids. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, sure. I get it. Um, but now I get it. Yeah. When you're when you're talking about a holistic approach to the birthing process, when you have like a mind, body, spirit, soul, you know, all of that kind of focus. Um, I think one of the big questions I've had a lot of people wrestle with when they're pregnant is, do I do it at home or do I do it at a birthing center or do I do it at a hospital? And a lot of women, I mean, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, for me, growing up as I have, pregnancy is seen as an emergency. Like it happens, you're about to have a baby, and it's a very traumatic, uh, it's a huge medical s surgery. Like that's what it feels like when the baby's born. You know, you're rushed to the hospital, and then there's, you know, you might be there for like 22 hours or whatever, and there's just... Um, there's an increase of C-sections as well for people who go to the hospital as compared to people who go to a birthing center. Um, and there's just a lot of worry that something's going to go wrong and it's just going to be a very difficult experience. I've really not heard too many ladies who are, you know, really excited about having their baby. It's more like, oh yeah, I'll be excited when it's all over. It'll be better. Um, so for you, like, how did you um, choose for yourself how the birthing process would happen? Um, and how did you, what was your mindset? Like, were you really scared or how did you kind of develop a mindset of, you know, this is natural. This is what happens to so many different people. This is part of what it means to be a woman is to be able to give birth like this. How did you, how did you work on the mental side as well as choosing what you wanted to do physically? 
That's such a great question. And I have so many answers because this is what I'm so passionate about. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say my number one passion is educating women um, and partners to help them feel empowered and not fearful because that is how it has been portrayed. Yeah. I think that birth is natural. It's like the most beautiful and incredible thing that our um, bodies are physically capable of and that we are created for and um, that all the female um, animals birth their babies. And so it is a very primal and innate instinct and whether it's um, in a medical setting or not, you're going to birth. Um, if you are pregnant, your body will birth a baby. And in med- Western medicine is incredible because a lot of uh, moms or babies used to pass in the birthing process if there wasn't yeah. kind of support that they need. And so that's how it came to be. And I find that the more medicine we use, um, the further we get away from our innate abilities and the more of our power that we give to someone else's hands saying, you know, best for me, instead of saying my body knows what to do and I will do it in a safe space in the case that I'm needing extra support. And so that's how I view um, the home birth center hospital births is that you can absolutely birth at home. If everything is uncomplicated and low risk, then you can birth at home, but be near a hospital in case things take a turn because things can take a turn very quickly. I work in a high risk hospital and not the kind of high risk hospital that all the other high risk hospitals are, but it's a very big um, hospital where we see all of the things that all the other hospitals don't, where we get all of the really sick moms and babies transported to us to take care of them. So it's an hmm. extra medical, medical place um, where we have the ability and resources to take care of a lot of different kinds of scenarios. And so um, in my eyes, I've seen so many um, emergencies or things that have gone awry um, hmm. because of high risk the hospital is that I work at um and so I always say to be near near to a hospital or have a plan to get to a hospital um because we also get the birth the home birth or birth center transfers um that need to go to a hospital and if the home birth transfer takes longer than a certain amount of time it can increase the risks um and all of that sounds really scary and so to touch on your fear point is that physiologically, if our bodies are experiencing or in fear, we are not going to birth a baby. So if you imagine that you are out in a rural space and you are, let's just say you're hiking and you're pregnant and you um, are contracting and you're soon to give birth and you have chosen to, let's say, give birth out in nature. Well, if you are confronted with a mountain lion and your body goes into fight or flight, it will pause the birthing process to get into a safe space before you birth the baby. Mm -hmm. So if you get into the hospital setting, if you are fearful of birth and fearful of the process and fearful of the hospital setting or fearful of anything about it, your body does not feel safe enough. You're in fight or flight and your hormones are working against you to give birth versus if you go into it with that mindset that you're talking about where you trust your body and know that this is what your body is capable of and made to do and that you feel safe in the space that you've chosen to give birth in for whichever decision you have chosen, then that creates a completely different environment within your body, within your mind to be able to save birth. And so as much as birth is a physical process and you can support that physical process with 
um, different tools like yoga and breath work and um, pelvic floor exercises and also pelvic floor relaxation and all of those things that can help support your physical body. The mental aspect of labor, I'd say, and even studies have shown 50-50, if not more than, um, yeah. because if your mind is running and telling you this hurts, I can't, this is hard, um, that is shutting your body down, right? It's mind over matter. And so if you're telling yourself all the affirmations, you're trusting, you're surrender, you know that you can, your body is saying, yes, okay, I will open. And hmm. so that mental practice in pregnancy to trust your body, to know that everything is okay, and to trust when it's not okay. Trust your intuition when something feels wrong. Um, that's a really powerful tool as well. But the mental aspect of it all is something that is is learned. It's something, it's a practice. And so if you show up to a marathon day of and think you're going to run the whole thing with ease, um, that would be, a, I mean, an incredible task. And so um, pregnancy and I mean, birth is like a marathon. And so you want to prepare for it and not just with education and not just with physical things, but also with the mental part. And so I think that's why I specifically created the course that I did is to encompass all of it and Holistic means um, all of it, you know, inside out, mind, body, soul, and medication if you need. Um, yeah. And I find that it's really hard these days to find information that allows you to choose what's best for you without yeah. there being um, a, you know, something pushed. Like if you're going to birth at home, do no medication and, you know, medicine is the bad bad guy or, or um you have to deliver with this kind of medicine in this kind of hospital da, 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 in no space for um anything natural holistic and having a space where you're offered both and empowered to choose what's best for you given all the knowledge that is a really cool place to be what did how did you decide what you were going to do like when you were especially when you're having your first baby what kind of gave you the clarity of mind where you were like okay this is what I want to do. And, and what did you decide? How did that turn out? Um, something I always say is that no plan is the best plan. I think if you are educated to have um, all the information about your preferences and the things that you would like in a perfect world, but know that things can change and that you can adjust and flow with the changes and um, your birth idea can evolve then that creates the best mindset for anything to happen and to feel safe. And so I went into my birth with one idea of how I would like it to go. I did meet my own resistance when things changed. And I had to remind myself um, that plans change. And you don't write an essay when you arrive into this life of how you'd like it to go and expect it to go exactly that way. You know, life throws you so many curveballs and you know, takes you down roads that you thought you'd never have to go down. And that's, that is birth. And so if we can prepare ourselves for what we would like, but also prepare ourselves for um, the changes and what that might feel like, then you can meet them with more ease when they do arrive. Um, mm. Instead of finding that resistance and not being able to move past your wishes. What was the change that happened that changed for you what you were going to do? Yeah, so I originally wanted um, to have an unmedicated birth. I imagined myself going to labor at home, my husband and I um, being here for some time, and then, you know, going into the hospital when things started to get more intense, and that would be that. Um, and... I ended up having an induction. Um, I had a couple of high blood pressures um, for being late to my appointment. Um, and so um, I stayed for the induction. I, I met resistance because I didn't have, I don't believe in my heart that I truly had hypertension in my pregnancy. I think it was just like an anxiety moment. Um, but I was 
in the hospital setting and I trusted my team and I was already term. And so I agreed to stay for an induction. Okay. Um, and so that was the resistance that I met. And when receiving medications to um, starve or augment labor, I had to give myself permission to get an epidural so I could meet the medications that I was being given with medication instead of trying to have an unmedicated birth in the setting of receiving medications, if that makes right. sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and, and I still question whether that induction was ne necessary. Um, and I embrace the story for what it was. But the second time around, I, again, was like, okay, well, maybe I'll try an unmedicated birth this time around. And um, <laughs> unplanned, he came at 33 weeks. And um, I did get my unmedicated fast birth. Um, but then it came with its own challenges as well of having our Nikki stay and such. And so it was just a um, reminder to myself again, that you can plan for one thing and want one thing and, and you're given, you know, what you're meant to have for whatever reason. And you do have, you know, some sort of control. And, um, I could have said, you know, no, I don't want to go through with this induction. Um, I'd like to measure my blood pressures at home. And if, it, if it's high at home, then I will come in. Um, but at the time I didn't feel like so strong that I sure. couldn't there, you know, I wasn't 28 weeks with preeclampsia needing something, um, urgent for delivery for my health and baby's health. It was, um, calm and we were there and our, my bag was already packed at home. So I sent my husband to go get that. And, um, and that was that. I, it's, you were, you're talking earlier about preparing for pregnancy, um, even what we're talking about now, even physically preparing with some exercises and so forth. Um, what, how would you encourage women to be active? Because I think um, for many of my friends, and also I think just for a lot of women in general, they're in a lot of pain, you know, back pain, or they're really struggling with heartburn, or these side effects that really make it uncomfortable, and they don't like to move around. They don't want to go on a walk. They, you know, they want to go to bed, lie down. Um, and so I wanted to touch on that with you is, you know, is there a way to help the labor process be maybe a little less painful or stressful on the body by being active? Or does the active component of it not play a very significant role in how the labor will turn out later? Um, it's tricky because I think it's so different for every person. And so what I'm going to share, I think is more of a theory of mine. Um, okay. and, um, I can't say for sure if that would yeah. be true, but I find that the healthier someone is, um, pre-pregnancy and same with fertility, right? We talk about these daily things that is so, I guess, annoying in a sense to hear yeah. because it's what everyone tells you all the time, but like eat well, sleep well, exercise, um, you know, take care of your body and do this and do that and get fresh air and vitamin D and, you know, spend time outside. And all of those things are being said over and over for a reason. And when you do those things and your hormones are in alignment, you get pregnant easier. And if you've stayed mm -hmm. active, healthy, and your hormones are in balance, those um, side effects, although they will hit because your hormones change in pregnancy, they might not be as drastic. And your body is strong, and your pelvic floor is strong to carry that baby without major back pain, without major like pressure all pregnancy, because you've already worked on your pelvic floor. And that it's that pelvic floor that's holding the weight of the baby. And so if you have a really weak pelvic floor, you're having a lot of pelvic pain. Um, then again, there are, you know, so many other things that are in play and so many other things in medical history that um, can change the way that someone carries a baby. Um, and I have a little visitor here. <laughs> oh, that's totally fine. Totally good. It's, yeah. Um, but anyway, so all of that to say that preparing in pregnancy is already too late, right? You can prepare in pregnancy for birth, but it's already too late to prepare your body for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so 
pre-pregnancy part that we don't think about is really important. And we can, um, I find that a lot of people are like, okay, I know I'm going to want to get pregnant at the end of the year. So now's my time to like have fun, get everything out of my system and just like go out and do all these fun things that I'm not going to get to do when I'm pregnant or um, have children at home. And in reality, it should be, I know I want to get pregnant at the end of the year. How can I cleanse and prepare my body to get pregnant easier, to bear a baby easier, to give mm. birth easier? And we don't focus at all in our culture on um, preconception health, if that makes sense. Yeah. And so um, we can prepare in pregnancy and do these exercises and this and that, but we already came into pregnancy in one space and it doesn't usually get stronger in pregnancy yeah. after. Um, and so I think the biggest space to prepare would be um, preconception. And then in pregnancy, you can maintain. So for the people that don't feel well, and don't want to, you know, go to the gym or go to yoga, yoga or whatever, yeah. find something that does feel good to you. And it doesn't have to be drastic. You know, a walk can be short. It doesn't have to be brisk or, or um, like intense, but you can do whatever activity you did pre-pregnancy safely. Mm -hmm. Um, swimming is a really great option because it's, um, a place where you're buoyant and you don't feel that pressure, um, on your body as much. Yeah. Um, you can go to like a gentle flow, a stretching, even just like moving your body, um, slowly. Sometimes I would go to a yoga class and not do anything that the yoga teacher said. And I would just use it as a space to feel into my body and move my body the way that I wanted to. Um, and it just allowed me like an hour to an hour and a half to go somewhere and move my body, even if I was just taking the person's um, class as like an offering. And I was like, no, actually, I feel like laying here in Shavasana to this music. Yeah. Um, that's okay. It doesn't, exercise in pregnancy doesn't have to be going to the gym and running and lifting weights, it can be, um, hmm. gentle. Well, you know, that's, that's an encouraging, that's an encouraging word. Um, I wanted, and then just, I, one last question I had for you is how would you encourage somebody who's scared? I think, um, and we have touched on that a little bit already, but I do think pregnancy is a topic that causes a lot of fear because there's a lot of unknowns. And like you said, you have to be um, open to unknowns uh, to even be able to enjoy the process because the process is not predictable completely. You know, things can be different for everybody. How it's going to look for you is not how it's going to look for someone else. You know, it may not be the way your mom, you know, had a baby. It may not be the way your sister has one. You know, it's very different. And so how how would you encourage someone who's like, I really want to have children. I want to be a mom, but I'm really scared. And it just doesn't seem like a process that I'm capable of doing. How would you encourage in that based on, you know, your research and what you've done? Yeah. I think even as someone who's well-rounded in the birth space, I also met that kind of um, pregnancy anxiety and fears yeah. and a very natural thing to experience and a couple things are coming to me I think um number one is <laughs> find your boundaries of things that don't feel good so if um reading on google or finding your information on social media or comparing yourself to other pregnancies mm. is not good to you um learn to step away from it because that's just filling your mind and body with things that are provoking anxiety. Yeah. Um, and then find the things that do feel good. So um, find like the few people you um, admire and appreciate their two cents. If it's 
um, somebody that you follow or a book. I really loved um, Ina May's Guide to Childbirth. And her whole first half of the book is about women's experiences, ex women's experiences birthing unmedicated. Um, mm -hmm. And many of them had very large babies, like eight to 10 pounds sometimes. And wow. uh, just reading that book after having the experience I've had in the hospital setting and reading that book, it reminded me that birth is meant to be a natural process. Um, and so that I really loved to fill my brain with instead of filling my brain with the things that I see um, in the space of work that I'm in. Yeah. And I would say this to anyone with anything that someone wants to do, that if you want to do it, you should do it. And um, fear is going to come up for with anything. Like say you want to travel solo, but it makes you nervous to go abroad by yourself. Um, I would say, do it. I'd say challenge yourself that you would learn so much and grow so much from that experience. Or if you wanted to write a book, but you weren't sure how to do it and you didn't think anyone would ever read it, or you want to start a business, or if you want to give birth and have a baby and start a family, I would say, do it. And you'll, the fear will always be there, but yeah. you're going to through it. You're going to grow through it. Um, and I don't think that you would ever look back and regret any of those decisions of something that you wanted to do. Well, Jess, thank you so much. And again, listeners, she she's found an intimate mama. If I'll have a link to her website in the blog post as well as the podcast so that you can go and she has some courses she offers. There's coaching she does, advice she gives. Um, and there's a lot of testimonials on there as well of ladies who have gone through it and talked about how her advice was helpful. So I would really encourage you to take a look at that and do the research, um, get to talk to women who've done a whole bunch of different types of things. And just see what would be, you know, what's interesting to you to kind of dive in. Um, but again, Jess has a really great resource. And um, she also has a really fun Instagram account. I love seeing all of her different stories and um, tips she gives that are also very cheerful. It's not uh, dark and uh, depressing. They're cheerful posts, which is helpful. <laughs> so many things are dark and depressing. Um <laughs> So, but Jess, thank you so much. I It was such a gift to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. You're welcome.